Okay, so um, this is uh, more stuff about energy, yeah? So when we, um, when we were last discussing things just a few moments ago, we were talking about kinds of chemical reactions um, that uh, living things can do and, and exchange of covalent bonding partners and forming ATP and so on. In, all, in other words, all kinds of different energy exchange through chemical reactions, yeah? So a lot of the chemical reactions that, that living things do, and I don't know, I'm tempted to say all, but I don't know for certain if it's all chemical reactions, but a lot of the really important ones that we do are redox reactions. Um, so uh, redox reactions are energy intensive reactions that we do and um, all living things do. So as far as understanding redox, um, what, I can, what I can do here is sort of talk about the hallmarks of redox, not really give you a, a, a straight up definition. And, and to get a real definition of what redox is, um, you'd probably be better off asking a, a chemistry professor than me, right? Um, but y what, what you should what you should do is be able to recognize redox when you see it, yeah? It's kind of like, um, um, I guess the, you'll, you'll forgive me, but these are, these are hallmarks. Do you guys know what a hallmark is besides a greeting card? What? Something that's representative of it, yeah? A hallmark is a, um, so like, um, there's two people who walk into the to classroom, yeah? Do you guys know what a hippie is? A hippie? I don't want to, I don't want to offend anybody, yeah? But if I see, if two people walk into the classroom and the first person is, has a, uh, a tie-dyed bandana around their head and a t-shirt uh, with a big peace symbol on it um, and, and a, a leather vest from jeans that have uh, bell bottoms, yeah? And then, um, and then some Birkenstock sandals. Um, and then another person comes in wearing uh, a black leather jacket with snaps all over it and a big metal zipper um, and then big black leather boots with steel toes in them and, um, and um, a pack of cigarettes rolled up into the sleeve of his white t-shirt. Um, do you know which one is the hippie? Yeah. So um, it might not be certain, <coughs> right? But if you had to put some money down, you'd probably bet on the first one, yeah? Now, is that the definition of a hippie? <laughs> <laughs> Careful there. Um, so it's not, right? If you ask the hippie what the definition of a hippie was, he wouldn't say, well, to be a hippie, you have to dress like I do, right? Um, but he would say that it's a belief in a bunch of whatever, whatever it is that they believe, yeah? Does that make sense? Um, and this is not an endorsement or a condemnation, yeah? But, but, but the definition is separate from the, from the shirt and the fringy vest and the, and the jeans and so on and so forth, right? All those things are clues that you're looking at a person that is a hippie. Does that make sense? Yes. Are you looking at an internet <laughs> definition of a hippie? A person of unconventional appearance typically having long hair wearing beards associated with subculture involving rejection of conventional values and taking hallucinogenic drugs. Well, that's really what matters is the hallucinogenic drugs, right? That's what the whole thing's about. Okay. Um, what do you think about that definition? De so clearly it says the first thing it said was unconventional, and yet 
we created this person that was very obviously a hippie, and we created him quite easily. Yeah. Um, so so conventional is is uh, uh, being unconventional is is uh, is is not so easy, right? Um, and so of course that definition completely blows off the things about peace and harmony and love, right? And you might think that peace and harmony are kind of nice values, right? So um, if I was if I was a, a hippie, I'd be like, just because I take hallucinogenic drugs doesn't mean I don't believe in peace, <laughs> or something. I don't know. Anyway, this is not a this is not a class about the value uh, about values or anything like that, right? The purpose of my of my definition is to get you guys to understand what a hallmark is, yeah? And a hallmark is not a definition of a thing. It is a, it is something that helps you identify that thing, yeah? Um, so oxidation means losing an, if you see something lose an electron, that is not the definition of what oxidation is. But when something loses an electron, it's getting oxidized. Does that make sense? Right? When you see something gain an electron, that is not the definition of reduction, um, but something that gains an electron becomes reduced. And that's a really good way to remember the difference, right? When something gains an electron, what happens to its charge? It goes, electrons have a negative charge, so its charge goes down. In other words, its charge is reduced. Does that make sense? So that's a very good way to remember, yeah? If something gains hydrogen atoms, it is also reduced, right? If something gains oxygen, it's oxidized, yeah? Does that mean that everything that is oxidized has to gain oxygen? Not necessarily, right? If it loses an electron, it can lose it in another way besides gaining an oxygen atom. Does that make sense? These are hallmarks. They are not the definition, yeah? But one thing is certain is that redox, the term redox, is not just a contraction. It shows that redox is the real process. There is no oxidation without reduction. There is no reduction without oxidation. It is a chemical reaction that is what's called a zero-sum game, right? If one thing gains an electron, the other thing has to lose an electron. Does that make sense? Because the net amount of electrons does not change. Does that make sense? You guys got that? Okay, so um, when this happens, energy can be released or absorbed, yeah? Redox reactions can be exergonic and endergonic reactions that are the reactions that, to some degree, we've been talking about, yeah? Um, let's go back here. Is this a redox reaction? It actually is. The carbon atoms here used to have a lot of hydrogens around them, yeah? What happened to those carbon atoms? They lost hydrogen and they gained oxygen. So what happened to the carbon in this situation? Did it get oxidized or reduced? It got oxidized, right? It picked up oxygen, it lost hydrogen. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so moving on. Um, here we go. Which is the most oxidized? Right? So chemical reactions were required um, to make each of these molecules, right? Which of those were in which of those in which of those reactions did carbon get oxidized? In which of those did carbon get reduced? Yeah? Do you understand? So I've and do you see the commonality between these four molecules? What do they all have in common? Carbon. They all have exactly one carbon atom. So technically, each of these is a different, what's called an oxidation state of carbon. Yeah? You've heard of some of these, yeah? Methane, that's what's coming out of our Bunsen burners, yeah? Carbon dioxide. Formaldehyde, we use that to embalm dead bodies, yeah? And then methanol, this is white lightning, this is wood alcohol, this is, uh, 
this is, um, yeah, this is um, used in Formula One race cars as fuel, yeah? So which is the most oxidized? Which is the most reduced? Which is highest in energy? Which is lowest in energy? Can you, can you guess those? Raise your hand if you've got a guess. All right, so um, which is the most oxidized? Netta. Uh, I guess A because it has uh, the most uh, hydrogen. It, it has more hydrogen than oxygen. Yeah. Uh, and then B because hydrogen is uh, bound with oxygen, so it's more Ah, what do you think? Other answers? D. Why is D the answer? So you guys are choosing op opposite answers for which is the most oxidized, yeah? Why is D the answer? It has more oxygen on it, yeah? Any other answers? Which is the correct answer? So Netta sounds like it's changing her answer, yeah? She, w she wants to, to, to separate herself from her original guess which is a completely legitimate guess, yeah? But, but this is the correct answer is that because this has more oxygen, it has been more oxidized, yeah? Right? Oxidized, oxidation has happened to this guy, right? What, what Netta, the rationale for Netta's guess is actually pretty legit, yeah? What she said was, this has the greatest potential for oxidation, yeah? And, and that's true, right? This one has the greatest potential to be oxidized. This one can't be oxidized any more than it already is. Does that make sense? Because carbon always forms how many bonds? Four bonds, and all four bonds are to oxygen for this guy. All four are not to oxygen for this guy. They're to hydrogen. So this guy has gained all the hydrogen he can gain. This guy has lost all the hydrogen and gained all the oxygen that it can gain. Does that make sense? Right? Now, which is the highest in energy and lowest in energy? This is not something you'd be able to, to guess without applying your prior knowledge of these molecules. Right? So this one would be harder for you guys to guess. Any guesses? Tori. So highest or lowest in energy, D? What do you think? Many people agree, yeah? What, the highest in energy is this one. Methane. How is that the case? Well, again, we have to apply what we know about methane. It's in our Bunsen burners, yeah? It, this is natural gas. We use this to heat our homes. CO2, this comes out the tailpipe, so it's the lowest in energy. Does that make sense? Right? So, um, as it turns out, on Earth, reduced molecules tend to be higher in energy, and that's because our Atmosphere has a lot of what in it? Oxygen. And when oxygen reacts, right, energy can be given off, and there's lots of oxygen in our atmosphere, right? Because it's, to some degree, the reason energy is given off in, in, uh, in oxidation and not reduction is because oxygen is plentiful and reduction is scarce, yeah? If you look inside a cell, you see most of the things inside the cell tend to be reduced. If you look outside the cell, you see that most things outside the cell tend to be oxidized. Um, okay, why do we care? Well, again, this is redox reactions are the kinds of reactions that happen in living things to make those living things go. Um, so, um, the exchange of electrons that happen in redox reactions um, is is part of what goes on. And so we have molecules called um, redox molecules whose whole job it is to pick up and drop off um, electrons. And one of those, one of the ones we're gonna talk about today is NAD. And NAD is a redox molecule because it is continually picking up and dropping off electrons in the same way that ATP is picking up and dropping off phosphates, yeah? Is that a useful comparison? All right, so let's, 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 um, let's talk about a couple other things, right? So you, if you're getting, dis, is anyone getting discombobulated as to what we're talking about now? 
I'm giving you a lot of little factoids, and if you're feeling confused, um, I can only sympathize, right? These facts seem loosely connected to me as I'm presenting them. So if you're having trouble, stay cool, okay? Is that, is that clear? All right, so um, one last thing, again, the presence or absence of appropriate enzymes determines the metabolic character of microbes. We talked about this last week, yeah? Right, you understand this? Because things have particular enzymes, they can do particular chemical reactions, and we can use that to identify them, and that can determine how they behave in their environment. Okay, so um, chapter five, a lot of it is about me metabolism of carbohydrates, yeah? Can you, can you metabolize carbohydrates? In other words, can you eat carbohydrates? The simplest and correctest answer is yes. Let me ask this, can you metabolize all carbohydrates? There are some that you guys cannot eat, yeah? Does that make sense? Do you know what those are? Say it again. Can you digest, is wood a carbohydrate? Silence. Starch. Is starch a carbohydrate? Yes. And it's from plants. Can we digest starch? Yes, we can. We can eat potatoes and enjoy them. Yeah? Is that the only carbohydrate that comes from plants? No. Give me another one, Michael. Cellulose. Fiber. Yeah? Can we, can we eat fiber? So, so that's a carbohydrate that we're not able to digest. So some of them we can eat and digest them. Digest them, yeah? So um, what about other microbes? Well, other microbes can digest other kinds of carbohydrates. As it turns out, there are bacteria that can digest cellulose, yeah? They do have the enzymes to digest cellulose. And they sit in our gut. And when we eat uh, soluble fiber, they ferment the soluble fiber and make all kinds of good compounds that end up in our bloodstream. Likewise, cows have, a, you ever heard that cows have four stomachs? Right? One of those stomachs is called a rumen. And basically, um, a rumen is sort of like a, a bacterial fermentation tank in which the cow eats a bunch of grass sucks out all the juice from the grass, and then, and then puts the, the, the fiber from the grass and bacteria break it down, break it down to a point where it is digestible, and then they, they chew their cud, yeah, they regurgitate from their rumen back into their mouth what was worked on by the bacteria, and then they swallow it back into their regular stomach for absorption. Does that make sense? Are you guys with me here? All right. So the, the person doing the real work there is the bacteria in that rumen helping them digest. Yeah? Okay. So some bacteria can digest carbohydrates that the cow can't and that we can't. Yeah? And so we see the relevance of metabolic diversity. Yeah? Okay. So. Um, Carbohydrates are the most common energy source, but they're certainly not the only source. Can we eat lipids for energy? Sure, if I have olive oil on my salad, that olive oil has calories that I can, that I can use, yeah? If I um, have butter, that's got calories that I can use. What about protein? The vast majority of amino acids in the cheeseburgers that I eat in the beans that I eat and so on are not turned into muscle, right? I'd be pretty ripped if every single amino acid from the cheeseburgers and so on that I eat were converted into muscle, yeah? Most of them get burned in the metabolic furnace just like the carbohydrates and lipids that I eat. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so we can take lipids and burn them. We can take amino acids and burn them. We can take carbohydrates and burn them. We talk about carbohydrates because that is probably the most common, yeah? So humans catabolize carbohydrates by aerobic respiration. 
Are you guys familiar with this chemical reaction? If you are or if you aren't, you should highlight it. C6H12O6, what's that? Sugar, glucose. This is glucose or fructose. Glucose is the, the basic sugar, so, but basically that is what it is, carbohydrate. O2, what's that? CO2. H2O, of course. Water, right? So this chemical reaction yields energy, right? So I didn't put that in there, and, and I think that's kind of a typo, really. Right? I do have it, plus energy. Okay, so put the word energy there as part of the reaction, yeah? Okay, um, so this is the reason we breathe. The reason we breathe is to get oxygen to do this, right? Every one of our cells is doing this job to make ATP, yeah? The energy that we get from this is used to make ATP um, that we depend on. Without that, we'd be dead, yeah? That's why we die if we stop breathing, yeah? Well, is that, does, does every bacterium do this? You guys know that some bacteria um, are obligate anaerobes, yeah? In other words, they'll die in the presence of oxygen. Do you think they're doing aerobic respiration? Very unlikely that they're doing aerobic respiration if they die in the presence of oxygen, yeah? Does that make sense? So if that's the case, they've still got to get energy some way, yeah? It doesn't make any sense to have a microbe that doesn't require energy. All living things have to have energy, right? But whatever these microbes, like Clostridium tetani, yeah? Clostridium tetani causing tetanus in this, in this poor guy, yeah? And his muscles are all tightening because of the Clostridium tetani. And how did he get it? Um, well, you can get tetanus from stepping on a rusty nail, right? You step on that nail and the little spores get into your body and then the endospores wake up and start start wrecking up the place, yeah? They start growing, releasing toxins, and the toxins make your muscles tighten up, and then your muscles in your rib cage tighten up, and you die, and then the tetanus bacterium gets to feast on your dead body, yeah? Does that make sense, right? So, it is an obligate anaerobe. The reason that it woke up is because it was planted deep into the oxygen poor tissues of your body, yeah? That's the only way it was able to survive. But if that's the case, if he dies in the pres presence of oxygen, he's definitely not doing this, is he? He's not doing aerobic respiration. So he must be getting his energy from some other way. Does that make sense? So this is the way we do it. This is the way many bacteria do it, but it's not the way everybody does it. Does that make sense? All right. So let's look at how it how it gets done so that we can use one way of doing it as a comparison for other ways of doing it. Is that clear? In other words, how do we get our energy? How do some bacteria get our energy? How do other bacteria get their energy? Well, again, here is aerobic respiration, the most basic means for cells to get energy. Um, so, uh, looks like I have a question there. Looks like we already see the answer, yeah? which is oxidized, which gets reduced. You guys, can you see that sodium is getting oxidized? Why is sodium, ga why do we know that sodium is getting oxidized? Its charge is going up, and, and what causes its charge to go up? Losing an electron, yeah? And, and chloride gained an electron and became reduced. Okay, powerhouse of the cell, you guys know that one? Mitochondria, how many people knew this from a previous class? Powerhouse of the cell, right? So we're going to see how that goes down today. All right, so here is aerobic respiration. If you understand this slide, then all the stuff I'm about to talk about should be just review, yeah? Um, if, you, if you turned this into a, a couple of flashcards, the, the information here should be enough to, to get you most of the way through, through aerobic respiration, yeah? Um, so, um, but, but the reason I talk about it is because understanding things helps you remember them, yeah? All right. 
So here is, here it is. Glycol there's three steps in aerobic respiration, three basic steps. Glycolysis, citric acid cycle, and electron transport chain, yeah? Glycolysis, we break apart glucose. Two pyruvates are formed, we get a little ATP. Citric acid cycle, pyruvates are broken, I don't know what broken means, I think it means broken, into CO2. Um, redox molecules are charged up and a little ATP is gained. In electron transport, lots of ATP is made by ATP synthase. Yeah, and we'll learn about ATP synthase. And we get about 32 to 34 ATP per glucose, way more than the amount of ATP we're getting from the citric acid cycle or glycolysis. Okay? Questions? All right, moving on. So here's glycolysis. It happens in the cytosol little bit of ATP. Citric acid cycle and, um, and electron transport, that happens in the mitochondrion of a eukaryotic cell. A little ATP from citric acid cycle, a lot of ATP, so I made this bigger from, uh, from electron transport. This also says oxidative phosphorylation, chemiosmosis. Um, these are vocabulary terms you don't need to know, but um, you know, we'll go over them and, and see if there's a use for them. Okay, so glycolysis, that's the first step, yeah? Um, so glycolysis is where electro, um, um, well, can we dissect what glycolysis means? Oh, I can't because, oh, yes, I can because I'm using a, uh, a scroll bar. So we're going to do word surgery on glycolysis. Where do we cut? After the glyco and before the lysis. So um, what does the glyco mean? Sugar. Sugar. Lysis? Breaking. Breaking, yeah. To break or to pop or to cut, yeah? And what's happening? Well, we can see effectively glucose being broken in half, yeah? So what do we, what do we I have a, a chain of six little gray balls connected by lines. What does that diagram represent? What is this? This is glucose. It says glucose in very fine print. Can you see it on your PowerPoints? Is that too small to read? If it is too small to read, you can always write it in there. Yeah. So this little, little chain represents glucose. Is that the way glucose has been shown before? What do the little balls represent? Carbon atoms. So glucose is C6H12O6, yeah? The six balls here represent the six carbon atoms, yeah? Right? Why do we show it as six balls? Because we're, we're trying to follow the carbon atoms. What are these lines in between? What do they represent? The little lines connecting the carbon atoms. Those must be covalent bonds, yeah? And what do you guys know about covalent bonds? They are shared electrons, aren't they? And in those shared electrons, there's energy, yeah? There's energy in covalent bonds, as we've seen earlier in today's lecture, yeah? You remember seeing energy in covalent bonds, because when they're broken and reformed, energy can be released or absorbed, yeah? So, you guys convinced, yeah? So, what happens? We break apart glucose. Is energy released? or absorbed. Energy is released, yeah? So we break it in half, we get a little energy. And we also get a couple of electrons, right? right? So we can see here a molecule called NAD, NAD plus, can you see that? I'll make this bigger here, because again, it's really small. NAD plus, and this is NADH, so what happened to NAD plus? Did it get oxidized or reduced? Everybody think about it. People shouting out answers. Take a second. Remember the definition of oxidation. Remember the definition of reduction. All right, hands in the air. People are now, let me hear it. I got.
It's reduced, yeah? NAD plus to NADH. What happens to its charge as it goes from NAD plus to NADH? Goes down, yeah? What, how much, what's, what else is changing? It's picking up this thing here. What's that? Hydrogen, gain of hydrogen, loss of charge. What is that? Reduction, reduction in charge. From plus one down to zero, that's a reduction in the charge value, yeah? From plus one to zero is a loss of one, yeah? So um, this guy is getting reduced, yeah? And, it, and when it's getting reduced, what's, what do we see happening? Well, we can see it gaining two electrons. These two little spheres here are negatively charged electrons, yeah? And where did they come from? They came from this covalent bond, right? A covalent bond is a pair of electrons being shared between two atoms, or, isn't that right? Okay, so this is a simplification, um, but I think it's a simpl simplification that highlights what's important, yeah? Which is that when we eat, what we're doing is stripping down the food we eat for electrons and the energy in those electrons, okay? You guys got that? All right. So, um, though, uh, we're also getting a little ATP out of this reaction. Again, this is a, 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 a gross op oversimplification. Glycolysis is actually a 10-step process, right? This picture, I think, is complicated enough and yet it's not even telling the whole story. It's a 10 step process and these steps are so fine as, as to not even be legible on my screen here, right? But what do we see? We see glucose becoming glucose 6-phosphate, becoming fructose 6-phosphate, becoming fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, becoming two different molecules here and then um, so on and so forth. Why am I even showing these? Do you need to know this? Ah, not really. But you need to, so the reason I'm showing it, it it's a 10 step process. What's making each of these 10 steps happen? Enzymes are, are doing it, yeah? This is hexokinase. This is phosphoglucose isomerase. This is phosphofructokinase. This is aldolase isomerase. Every step, an enzyme makes it happen, yeah? And in a complex, this is, like, this is like a molecular chop shop. Do you guys know what a chop shop is? Right? Um, so we are dismantling a molecule in order to get energy out of it the same way a chop shop dismantles your Honda Civic in order to sell it for the m value of its parts, yeah? Is that, is that clear? Okay, um, right, and that analogy I can hopefully stretch to the next step, yeah? Every step is an enzyme, so a bunch of little, little Charlie Chaplins all working on the assembly line in the same way that a bunch of dudes in a chop shop are pulling the tires and the engine out of your car, yeah? Does that make sense? Okay, and they're selling it for money, we're breaking this down for ATP, okay? All right, so um, the end product is something called pyruvate. How many carbons is pyruvate made out of? Three, right? We took our six carbon glucose and turned it into two, three carbon, one, two, three pyruvates, yeah? We broke it in half. We did glycolysis. These three pyruvates, or these three carbons in the pyruvate, we can see Carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, which one has the most energy? Is the one that's most reduced, which is 1, 2, or 3? Three? 3 is the most reduced. It has 3 hydrogens. This one is the most oxidized. It's almost ready to become carbon dioxide, and it does. It floats off right there. Okay. So, Krebs cycle. In the Krebs cycle, basically, this is the real chop shop. The whole pyruvate gets completely dismantled and all the covalent bonds, the electrons holding these three atoms of carbon together are, are stripped out to make three NAD pluses into NADHs, yeah? 
And again, this is an oversimplification. You don't need to know all the details, but basically we're stripping the electrons out of this, um, out of this molecule in order to take those electrons. And where are we going to take them to? We're going to take them to the electron transport chain. Yeah? And the electron transport chain basically um, takes a bunch of, this is complicated, this is, and this is complicated, but it's the part of, of this, this process that I think is most important to understand because it's the one that tells the most lessons about energy, in my opinion. Okay? So, um, this is a, the electron transport chain basically is a bunch of proteins sitting in the membrane either of a prokaryotic cell membrane or of a, uh, the inner membrane of a mitochondrion in a eukaryotic cell. And these proteins pick up electrons and pass them to each other. And as they pass them to each other, they use them to, to store energy from them, right? They use their energy to basically um, help you make ATP. And this is how they do it. They pick up the electron. Once, if you happen to be, imagine these are electrons, yeah? And I, and I give them to Katie. All right, so I just gave Katie some electrons. What happened to Katie now that she has electrons? She becomes more negatively charged, yeah? And if I had a bunch of protons lying around, what would happen to those protons? They would rush towards Katie, yeah? Does that make sense? Katie could conceivably trap them, yeah? Okay, so when she traps them, she can hand them off to somebody else, yeah? So, um, there we go, thank you so much, <laughs> Xiao Xiao, for, right? So, she trapped her protons, but now Xiao Xiao has the electron. What happens to her? She becomes more negatively charged, and if there's still protons around, what can she do? She can trap a couple of them, yeah? And then she can pass off the, thank you so much, right? And then, so, so basically, it's kind of like a, a bucket brigade. Do you guys know the, the expression, right? If there's a fire, one, you, you get the water, you hand it to one guy, and then the, the next guy, and then finally the last guy. I'm mixing my metaphors. So, so let's look at the details of what's happening. As electrons go through Katie and Xiao Xiao and Netta, et cetera, et cetera, right? They each hold on to the electrons for a second and they trap protons from this side of the membrane to that side of the membrane, yeah? And after they trap them, they pass on the electrons so the next one in the chain can do the same thing. Does that make sense? All right, so why do we care? Well, because once we're done, where are all the protons? On the top or the bottom? On the top, all the protons from the work of the, the individuals in the electron transport chain, we've moved protons from here to here, yeah? Is this diffusion, osmosis, or active transport? It's active transport because the concentration of protons on this side is actually already high, yeah? So we move them from a low concentration to a high concentration against the concentration gradient, right? So why do we care about this? Well, as it turns out, we have a membrane here, and this membrane um, is holding these protons on this side. What's this look like? Well, to me, this is ATP synthase, and it looks like a turbine, yeah? Should we watch a little video to understand how that works? Is this thing working? It is working. Why, why not, huh? Okay. All right, so we'll go to YouTube. A, T, P, synthase. This is the one I usually watch. ATP synthase is a molecular machine. 
ATP synthase is a molecular machine that works like a turbine to convert the energy stored in a proton gradient into chemical energy stored in the bond energy of ATP. So we have um, a proton gradient, a disparity. We've got lots of little green spots on the top, not the as many on the The flow of protons bottom. down their electrochemical gradient drives a rotor that lies in the membrane. It is thought that protons flow through an entry open to one side of the membrane and bind to rotor subunits. Only protonated subunits can then rotate into the membrane, away from the static channel assembly. Once the protonated subunits have completed an almost full circle and have returned to the static subunits, an exit channel allows them to leave to the other side of the membrane. In this way, the energy stored in the proton gradient is converted into mechanical rotational energy. The rotational energy is transmitted via a shaft attached to the rotor that penetrates deep into the center of the characteristic lollipop head, the F1 ATPase, which catalyzes the formation of ATP. The F1 ATPase portion of ATP synthase has been crystallized. Okay, so you guys see what's going on here? So this is the thing that, yes, is turning ADP into ATP. And we, we can see that here, yeah? ADP coming in with a phosphate. Spins around. The spark. F1 ATPase portion H of ATP, ATP synthase out. has been crystallized. What makes it spin around? The protons flowing through, yeah? And as the protons flow through, it spins around. And as it spins around, it takes ATP, it changes shape a little bit, and grabs an ATP and a phosphate and smashes them together. Yeah? And every time it spins around, three of those little ADPs are turned into ATPs. Yeah? Does this remind you of some stuff we've talked about earlier? Right? So it's spinning around like what? What's that? Is it turning around like a flagellum? That's not the answer I was looking for, but what do you think? Is that true? That's actually a powerful insight, yeah? Um, that actually is true. Um, if you look at the DNA sequences of ATP synthase and the DNA sequences of the flagellar motor, you can see that those DNA sequences are very similar, and that suggests what? similar evolutionary origin between the way a, a, uh, a flagellum works and the way ATP synthase works. And as it turns out, the way a flagellum works is with what's called the proton motive force, which is the same thing making ATP synthase work, yeah? So protons are doing what in order to make this thing spin around? They're flowing through the membrane, yeah? Does, remember we talked about the river and the potential energy behind the dam? Where's the dam here? The membrane. Where's the, where is the, where is the, uh, the water? Protons are like the water. And ATP synthase? That's like the little generator at the bottom of the dam, yeah? I, I personally find it remarkable that, um, you know, a, a a energy, an energy generating device that humans figured out how to make in the 20th century, yeah? I think Hoover Dam in 1930 something, yeah? Um, was one of the first major, major hydroelectric power sources for hydroelectric power. Um, and how, how long has ATP synthase been around? Billions of years, yeah? As long as eukaryotes have been around, ATP synthase has been around. And before eukaryotes have been around, yeah? The reason mitochondria are valuable to us is because they had ATP synthase to start with, yeah? Does that make sense? You guys following along? Right? So, so 
I, you can see um, the laws of, basically the laws of physics are working at the molecular level here in a very similar way to the way they're working at the, at the scale of the gigantic Hoover Dam in, in, uh, uh, in Nevada, yeah? Um, anyway, interesting, don't you think? Is anyone going whoa? I hope somebody's going whoa. Because I certainly, you know how excited I get about generating woes in students, yeah? So, what pulls electrons through the membrane? Well, as it turns out, oxygen, because it's really electronegative, really wants those electrons. And um, electrons are pulled through the membrane through the, uh, through the attraction of oxygen, yeah? Um, so oxygen gets reduced into water, yeah, by collecting, right, by gaining electrons and turning into um, water by also gaining protons, right? We, we deplete protons here on this side of the membrane, reinforcing the, the, uh, the gradient, yeah? You guys with me here? So um, we, just to review, um, NADH gives its electrons to the electron transport chain. Um, those electrons are used to generate a proton gradient and reinforce a proton gradient. That proton gradient, the protons flow back through ATP synthase, making ATP synthase spin around, generating ATP. Yeah? Where do the electrons come from in the first place? Do you guys remember that? They're, they're, they're coming from a NADH. But where did NADH get those electrons? From, from NAD plus is what it used to be. But where did the electrons come from? They came from glucose. Remember, we, we stripped down the covalent bonds in glucose in the in glycolysis and in the Krebs cycle, right? We stripped away those electrons. And those electrons were handed off to this electron transport chain in order to generate ATP. Um, it's, it's quite a, it's, it's an extremely complex but, but sophisticated mechanism. And, and fascinating. If it wasn't such a pain in the rear to learn, yeah? Um, but, but it's pretty cool, I think, yeah? And this is happening where? Inside mitochondria. What about in a prokaryotic cell? They don't have mitochondria. Well, in that case, it's happening in their cell membrane, yeah? In cells that are able to do this, they have the, uh, they have the electron transport chain in their plasma membrane, yeah? Guys with me here? Okay. So, during cellular respiration, NADH, um, a is converted to NAD plus by an enzyme called de dehydrogenase, is converted into ATP, is reduced to NAD plus, um, delivers as electron load to the electron transport chain or none of the above. What's the answer? D, right? NADH delivers its electron load. Is it converted into ATP? No. It's, it's a molecule that carries electrons. It, it, but the electrons are used to make ATP, but, but NADH doesn't turn into ATP. You understand? Um, okay. So, qu questions? 